Well, welcome everyone. First, let me introduce myself. I'm the Director of Research and Recovery at Skagit River System Cooperative. Skagit River System Cooperative, as many of you know, represents Swinmish and Soxhawatl within the Skagit Basin. And uh, the program that I'm leading that Eric Beamer had led for, I'll just round it up to decades, has been primarily tasked to evaluate recovery actions within the Skagit Basin, primarily associated with Chinook. And so we've been the main repository for data acquisition, empirical observations in the Skagit on how fish are responding to, to these recovery actions. We're not in a vacuum. We have many collaborators in, with NOAA and the state and other tribes in the county, um, this council and um, nonprofit groups. A lot of our work has been um, incorporated and reviewed by many other interests. But we always welcome other thoughts, opinions, and inference on how Chinook might be responding to recovery actions. In the last couple of science series, we got really in depth in the estuary. And one thought was to kind of take a step back with chapter eight of the schedule recovery plan and discuss again the general approach where it's not just one action and it's just not one area that um, we need to do things to recover Chinook. It is, it is a holistic approach. Most of us here know that Chinook have a life cycle where they start in the uplands with eggs in the ground. And after a period of time, those eggs hatch into alevins and then grow into fry and then they start rearing in freshwater habitats, moving downstream into the estuary, rearing in the estuary. And then as they get to a certain time or size, they begin to outmigrate into the saltier water. Um, and then they experience conditions, predation in the ocean. And then after three to five years, there's some one and two year runs that come back, but generally after three to five years, they come back to the Skagit in which they uh, intend to lay their eggs um, within the river again. Uh, the recovery plan acknowledges this upfront um, that we led with the biology, not with the necessarily the human enterprise, but led with the biology, what do the fish need? And then from there, tried to figure out reasonable approach to give them what they need. And so one aspect is that we know from the upper part of the watershed all the way to the estuary of the ocean that they require certain habitats to be successful, to be productive. And so the initial intent of the recovery plan is a whole life cycle approach. And while we get into the weeds or um, uh, sedges, let's say in the estuary, uh, we have, we've kind of maybe lost focus of this broader approach and intent. And it's never meant that one action has a higher priority than another action in the recovery plan. It's actually the separate, it's the other. It's all the actions are needed to achieve the recovery goal. So just to really visualize this, this is really different stages of fish across really different habitats. Um, from the upland, when we look at eggs and little tiny fish, to, to down lower in the floodplain and the delta where we have fry and par um, and, and ones that rear for an entire year being yearling, uh, to the open ocean and their importance of Chinook to killer whales and human harvest. So this, in a way, is a highly migratory species that uses thousands of miles. Of, of habitat to, to rear and it supports a lot of things along the way. When we try to think about implementation of recovery plan, one of the main levers, and I will talk about other ones, but one of the main levers that we have is potentially restoration, re uh, uh, converting land back to something that would be more beneficial to Chinook. And as we think about these restoration planning, we have the life cycle that we must kind of target. Um, we don't necessarily want to do a spawning restoration project in the Delta because the fish don't spawn there. Um, so simple things like that. And in the recovery plan, we identified early on that while spawning incubation may be at risk when we looked in the biology, and I will show you some evidence as we go forward, 
We also identified freshwater rearing is absolutely important. We knew in the literature and other systems at the time of writing this uh, recovery plan that floodplains uh, and delta habitats are important. And nearshore areas are as well. These juvenile fish can rear in these areas. And increasingly, we've been more concerned about the ocean survival. In chapter eight, we highlight the restoration planning across the areas what? in which we could restore, oh, okay. which is spawning, freshwater, spawning habitat, freshwater habitat, tidal delta, non-tidal delta habitat, and nearshore habitats. But we've had many questions and, and conversations amongst many of you during the science series is like, what about ocean survival? What's happening out there in the big blue? And we've been trying to articulate that is accounted for in the recovery plan, in their goals and either other components. So I'm kind of adding to chapter eight, which is the main premise of this presentation, um, some other components to know that is a holistic approach. And my goal, hopefully after this talk, is that you will have some evidence and in front of you and linkage back to the recovery plan that you see that this is a holistic approach to recovery. And so the main delineation across these habitats is that they're, they're kind of substantially different. And we can see that the amount of space of each one is substantially different. As I was just talking about the great big blue ocean, um, we have the upper watershed, which is much larger than the non-tidal delta and, and the tidal delta. But the size shouldn't push you into thinking one's more important than the other, because how the fish use this area is what's important. It's not whether one polygon is larger than the other. And so again, coming back to the fact that we have space and we have a life cycle that fish need. And to be more specific about that, as the fish are trying to complete their life cycle, there's this point in which they deviate in their pathway to complete their life cycle. And this happens after they hatch as eggs and they come out of the gravels. And depending on their growth and depending on um, freshwater conditions, they can remain within the freshwater systems for, for months, which would be a par migrant, um, something that, or stay in for an entire year, which would be known as a yearling. And depending on how long they stay in the freshwater it dictates how much or how they use delta habitats. And depending on how long they stay in the delta habitats would dictate how much they use the nearshore habitats. And each one of those pathways is consequential to the productivity of the population as a whole. And so this is important context as we think about applying restoration projects onto the landscape with those different polygons. So one thing I wanted to go through here is, you know, I'm a scientist and I wanna make sure that I show you the evidence that we're seeing. Um, this evidence may not convince you, that's not the intent. The intent is to show you the evidence that we're seeing that is driving us to our conclusions. And so I wanted to start with pulling out um, the initial where we have eggs in the gravel. The first kind of part of the restoration and understanding that we're trying to do to recover, implement recovery to the species. And spying and incubation is gonna be dealt with, I think later in our series, and it has a whole section of the recovery plan. And there's two components that we know that influence um, spawning and incubation of, of the eggs and the gravels. One is the amount of sediment. So uh, hill soap failures, roadway failures, um, particularly on, on upland lands. Uh, that deliver a lot of sediment can bury eggs and suffocate them. In addition, we have uh, flooding that can scour reds. And we have indications within the Skagit watershed at the time we were writing the plan that flood reoccurrences um, and larger flooding can actually scour reds and are really important to understand. In addition, dealing with sedimentation in the basin. And we'll have a, a future conversation about this. Again, my talk here is just kind of talking about the holistic approach to the recovery plan restoration, not necessarily getting into the details. Moving forward with freshwater rearing that we also talk about in chapter 10, and there's a series of projects associated to improve freshwater rearing out there, and uh, specifically in the floodplain habitat. And right here, I show a picture of Barnaby Slough. This is probably one of the bigger floodplain restoration projects that are, is happening, um, not just in the Skagit Basin, but probably in Puget Sound. 
And we have crews up there already uh, evaluating the first uh, phase of the project was removing infrastructure on the site. And, and when we want to do this restoration project, we want to focus in on which who um, the restoration project's for. And so with this, uh, we are interested in those fish that will be rearing in the area. And this is where we talk about those par fish. Those are fish that grow a little bit larger than the 40 millimeters and just something else are actually rearing in these floodplain habitats. And we understand this through this idea of as over time, we start seeing the fish reside starting to grow in size and suggesting that we have an uh, emigration or leaving of fry fish from these systems. This is an important aspect because par fish contributes, um, uh, contribute to the population productivity of the Skagit Basin. And we also know that in the floodplain habitat that the, there's been human enterprise, human actions that have taken away floodplain habitat uh, that are no longer usable by salmon. And this makes less uh, space for them to complete or do uh, conduct the life history pathways that they need to need to do. And what we've seen through some of the mapping is that since historical times, there's been about 31% loss of floodplain habitat, and that there's been armoring that we generally understand, not just in the Skagit, but throughout the range of Chinook salmon, uh, rip wrapping is, is not as beneficial as rearing habitat as more connected floodplain habitat. Not surprising, um, a collaborative project with Skagit River System Cooperative um, and the WDFW, um, which resulted in a publication from Zimmerman et al. 2015, highlighted that we have evidence to support that there is a capacity limit within the floodplain and that the number of these par migrants are getting cropped off because it seems like there's not enough habitat for them. So we see this decrease in habitat and we see this um, biological impact and thus the suggestion would be within the recovery plan is that we need more available habitat. So opening up floodplain habitat for these fish would lead to recovery or is what we um, are assuming. Another one is non-tidal delta habitat. We've lost about 98% of this non-tidal uh, delta habitat. So this is the upper delta area, which yes, so lots of homes are on and, and lots of area uh, uh, homes, cities, buildings, commerce are on. Interestingly enough, as we start looking at more recently at outmigration survival in and around these areas where in the upper delta, we see survival of outmigration to drop off. And so there may be a correlative there that maybe these fish need maybe not an entire restoration of the whole area, but if they had some layovers, if they had some places the rest that isn't a bunch of bull chat ch chasing them around in a channel, that they may do a little bit better. The next one is the Delta Rearing, um, which is associated with chapter 11. And there's a series of projects highlighted there. And again, there's been an estimated 73% loss of historical Delta habitat. Now I wanna really be specific here. I'm talking from historical, not the uh, discussions we've had recently in the estuarine um, science series about current changes or contemporary changes in habitat uh, footprint. Um, this is historical. And the areas that we're missing is primarily a lot of these blind channel or, or tidal channel areas um, shown in the picture here. This is a picture of the uh, South Fork Skagit. And we have the vegetated wetlands and distributed areas there. With this, you've seen this, uh, these graphics within this conversation before in the science series, is that we see again, this capacity limitation within the, the lower Skagit tidal delta and associated with this likelihood, this loss of habitat. And so if we could give them a little bit more habitat, uh, we would expect to see a, a, a return of a juvenile fish. And then hopefully if we give them enough, of adult fish down the road. Conversely, if fish are uh, habitat limited within the floodplain and then within the delta, they then go out to the near shore pretty quickly. And we see that there's a pretty direct relationship between outmigration abundance to these near shore catches, pretty much 
the floodplains full, the delta's full, so these fish go out to the near shore. And our general estimates of survival of these fish tend to be lower than the fish that rear in the freshwater and rear in the delta. And so as these fish go out in the near shore, there's still some value to get some um, pocket estuary and non-natal estuary habitat to give them some rearing potential. However, this is like, this is kind of the, the last ditch effort to give them some habitat. And the last thing I wanna bring about is that there's been this, um, there's been some comments of how like ocean survival is integrated in our understanding. And in chapter four, immediately we say within our recovery plans that we can't necessarily, or recovery goals, we can't necessarily control for ocean survival. So we will, we've set two independent goals based off of what we thought at the time was optimal survival versus, or high survival versus a low survival regime. And so the goals are reflective to changes in ocean conditions that we may not have that much control. However, I would say that we do have some control, maybe not locally, but regionally and across the Northern Pacific in our harvest management. And so one thing that we account for is in ocean conditions, trying to adjust harvest management in such a way that it doesn't overly exploit a stock. And so I wanted to point out to you, to you here today, this is a recent publication from Pacific Salmon Commission. This is a commission for the, the implements or reviews the Pacific Salmon Treaty uh, components um, of two indicator stocks. These are Chinook hatchery stocks. And these are what we use for trying to understand exploitation rates or total mortality in the basin. And one thing I just want to highlight here is that the majority of fish go on to the escapement ground. So uh, around 50 to 60 percent in any given year of the fish um, of that cohort come back and spawn onto the natural grounds. From that, um, there is about 40 plus percent that are then harvested across everywhere from Southeast Alaska all the way down to the Skagit River itself. And this management has been generally developed in such a way that we've been well below what we call our exploitation rate ceilings. These ceilings were derived by understanding things like ocean conditions and all other types of survival to to make sure that harvest does not appreciably uh, affect recovery of the species. And this has been written off or authorized by NOAA. And so here's another representation by year of how we're well below most years of the exploitation rate ceiling and the contribution of where the harvest occurs. And you've seen this before, Casey represented this earlier on in the science series, um, I think in the springtime. There's been often comments that the ocean survival is really low. And so why should we do anything if it's really low? And really the first thing is, is the Skagit is not the Puget Sound. We're a little special case. We have uh, good runs. We still have a lot of really good habitat. And, and so our estimated measures of survival on the ocean conditions have been pretty static where we've seen other stocks within Puget Sound on the West Coast tank. Um, and so one thing is, is the broad general, general patterns may not apply to the Skagit because we have uh, a robust and, and fairly functional natural habitat out there. What we're trying to do is we're just trying to do that extra work to get to our recovery. And so to put it in context, when we think about all the recovery actions, good way to think about it is across the four H's, habitat, harvest, hatcheries, and hydropower. And I wanna focus, like we've been talking a lot about habitat here in the Watershed Council, primarily because the Watershed Council is the lead entity that helps coordinate habitat restoration. And I just wanna remind folks that there are these venues where we talk about the other H's. Um, there's a venue that starts uh, generally January 1st um, and goes to May, uh, generally coined the North of Falcon process, but includes the uh, Pacific Salmon Commission meetings, the PFMC meetings, and the co-manager meetings to address harvest concerns in the face of recovery. And understanding that none of, uh, none of the harvest, or at least recently, has been directed on natural origin Chinook, primarily Chinook are caught in bycatch. Hatcheries also go through uh, 
uh, uh, HDMP process. And we all are fairly familiar that there's some discussions going on with hydropower right now. Uh, as we break down the habitat component, going back to that, um, habitat protection, keeping what we have is, is a big component of the recovery goals because we do have a lot of really good habitat and we should keep that message out there. We do have you know, functioning plug played habitat in some areas. We do have some really good positive gains in the estuary in some areas, um, but there is more to do. We do see that there's capacity limitation and that's inhibiting us to get to our recovery goals. And so from that, um, we have found that there are different components uh, that would attribute to that recovery, but it all needs to be done. So it's not an either or, it's an and. And then how we do this has to be pragmatic. And this is also identified very clearly in, in chapter eight of the recovery plan, where first of all, restoration and specifically the implementation of restoration needs to be applied across the life history strategies, it needs to be biologically relevant um, and applied thoughtfully in an ecological system, but should not burden any one land use or jurisdiction. It says it clearly in section 8.5. And so in the recovery plan, when we try to establish our restoration projects and maybe some of the pivot we'll look at when we go talk about floodplains and the upland spawning incubation, um, things that have been happening and what we've learned from them. Um, you'll see that the work really is intended to fit with the Chinook biology and the ecology of the system. We do a lot of hard work to try to make sure that it's technically feasible, that we can actually do it and it's not gonna lead to problems. And there's been broad engagement with landowners to make sure there's landowner willingness. And I just wanna end, so why we've been focused, and I think it's important to be focused on the estuary because that's an important aspect, but it's not saying any other place is less important. And that we have projects and we are working across the basin because the fish are using the basin and the, the estuary and the open ocean. And so we, we are tracking across the wholeness of what the fish use and the wholeness of the Skagit watershed when we think about recovery. Again, thanks, Mike. And let's go ahead and turn it over to Eric. So anyway, I'm just doing some review, not the whole thing. So here was the, um, the outline from last time where we went through, made some links to the recovery plan, which Mike just did and even broader. Um, and then we talked just about some of our approach and then gave results for fish and habitat. I'm gonna, I'm only going to focus on what's in blue or red. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time, mainly in the habitat side, about what we measure for habitat. I'm going to highlight the results, both for projects and system response for both fish and habitat. And most of it really is going to be about the habitat stuff. So what we do measure. So for habitat, we measure two metrics, titled Delta um, Habitat Extent. And I have a clunky acronym for it for this presentation. It's essentially synonymous with the uh, partnership common indicator functional estuary surface area. Um, it's used for a number of things. It's part of the research program at SRSC to measure this thing as a status and trend kind of a pro programmatically, um, but we use it to track the salmon recovery plan objectives. So if you know in each of the um, restoration chapters, there's there's generally a habitat metric or two that um, are identified. And so we we set up a monitoring program to measure those for our uh, for ourselves. And then we offered to give that to anybody. And uh, as Mike said, um, we'd welcome anyone's you know review of it. And uh, but specifically we've offered it to the lead entity process, which is set up under the partnership to coordinate monitoring and adaptive management, at least for the habitat restoration side of things. So, um, but it's also used, and this is a very important part, um, it's used in the Skagit IMW. Um, so the Skagit IMW intensively monitored watershed is an IMW, the only one in Puget Sound for Chinook salmon, and its purpose is to um, monitor response of Chinook salmon to estuary restoration. So that, that part um, is, uh, is uh, a needed component of the IMW. And the IMW is uh, 
is a multi-agency effort um, with PIs or principal investigators from NOAA, WDFNW, and SRSC. Both Mike and I are the SRSC um, PIs. Corey Green is the PI for NOAA, and Joe Anderson is the PI for WDFNW. Um, so there's another metric that we also glean out of the habitat data, and we call that prime rearing area. Another clunky acronym, P PRA. It's a, it's a measurement that's consistent with the habitat variable used in the original analyses for the Chinook recovery plan. And it's also used in the IMW, and it's a, it's a metric that's gaining traction um, with other estuarine Chinook analyses across Puget Sound. There's a number of ESRP studies that um, have used that metric. So those are the two things that we measure, and I'll tell you what they are. Last time, I didn't explain the metrics. I just showed you some habitat. This is the slide I showed you. I showed you different kinds of habitats. Um, so for tidal or vegetated wetlands, there might be the emergent uh, marsh systems or the um, scrub shrub wetlands, tidal wetlands, or um, tidal forests even at the upper end of this island, or distributary or the open-ended channels or the blind-ended channels. Um, but there's, there's a lot more detail um, to the habitat scheme. And so specifically with our data, we're digitizing from high resolution ortho photos approximately every five years. Um, a number of habitats, I think there's actually 12 different habitat types, but basically the tidal delta habitat extent is the sum of the water polygons. The, there's different kinds of water polygons, different kinds of vegetated wetlands, uh, and other intertidal subtidal habitat polygons. So for the, um, for the water, we're summing the blind channel areas, distributary channel areas, and it's in the in this habitat scheme called impoundments, but these ponds that you see out in the estuary, and then boat harbors. We have boat harbors, um, albeit not many, except for in Swinomish Channel. Um, so those are the water polygons, and they're the sum of those plus the sum of the, these tidal wetlands. So we have marsh, emergent marsh, we have scrub shrub, and we have riverine tidal forest. So all those areas do are exposed to tidal. Um, inundation to some degree. And so they're, they're part of that metric. And then our other polygon types is intertidal wood and uh, low tide terrace. Low tide terrace is, uh, is essentially the unvegetated flats that are within the, the tidal delta. And I'll show you some pictures of this. So the sum of all these um, habitat types is what that um, tidal delta habitat extent metric is. And so um, I'm gonna show you some results um, later on that are based on these um, five areas within the um, Skagit Tidal Delta. It's not the old, these are not the only five. There's actually an area to the south that wraps around on Camino Island, but these are the areas where we have data through 2019. So there's Swinomish Channel, um, there's the North Fork, there's the Bayfront, then there's a South Fork. And there's a little tiny polygon that's the Lower River main stem. It's, it's kind of a constant in our data set. It doesn't really change. Um, and then here's a map of the different habitat types. Um, and, and they really don't show up at this scale. You can see the wetlands um, all lumped together as one type and the distributaries and you can kind of get a hint of some dark blue, which is the, the blind channels or tidal, inner, uh, tidal channels. What's primary habitat area? So that's calculated from those tidal delta habitat extent polygons. And it's the sum of blind channel, total area of blind channels and impoundments, because these are water. This is where fish could directly reside or be in. Um, and then it's a two meter wide area of the perimeter of distributaries and boat harbors. So the reason that it's not the whole area of distributaries and boat harbors, the fish sampling suggests that there's a much higher density um, on the edges of these kinds of habitats. So for rearing area, for primary rearing area, we're only giving credit to the edges, um, a buffered area, uh, a buffered edge of those habitats. Um, and again, this is a, it's a different kind of metric, but that's how it's calculated. So 
What does some of this stuff look like? I have a few photos to click through here for you. So here's an area near Wiley, uh, the restored state of uh, Wiley, um, where you see a distributary. This is um, freshwater slough. And so for prime rearing area, you'd only get credit for the buffered edge of the, that distributary. Um, but then there's other places like this blind channel here and you know pretty much all the other all this area, this is Lower Teal Slough in the Wiley um, Slough Restoration Project, or just downstream of the Wiley Slough Restoration Project that the Teal, or that sort of more, um, what is it, Northwestern lobe, or Eastern lobe of the uh, project is located, so connects to, so that's all blind channel. That would be for primary and area, be the total area of those channels. Um, and then you see this area, it, it is a little bit um, dewatered in this photo, um, but these would be um, assessed in our methodology as impoundment, um, but it's kind of morphing towards uh, low tide terrace. So that's one example of what some of those habitats look like. Here's another more extreme example on the other end of the spectrum. So here's, here's Swinomish Channel, which is a distributary in our habitat scheme. So for primary and area, it only gets credit for the perimeter of that. Um, here's a boat harbor. It would only get credit in primary area for the perimeter, you know, buffered area, as opposed to here's some fill removal site areas um, near the Swinomish or adjacent to Swinomish Reservation that you'd have. Um, this is tidal wetland, vegetated tidal wetland of an estuarine emergent marsh. It's not part of primary area, um, but it is part of the Tidal extent, habitat extent. Um, these areas are blind, get credit as tidal channel, blind channel um, in primary rearing areas. So that gives you some idea of what goes into the calculation. Here's a here's a another photo at, at hole in the wall area of um, Swinomish Channel, where you can look over into Dunlap Bay and see more, you know, the more natural habitats in contrast to. Um, to Swinomish Channel, but what I wanted to highlight here was here's a small boat harbor. It would the primary area would only be the perimeter, buffered perimeter of that. Um, here's a here's an area of wood accumulation. This is intertidal wood, so it goes into um, the calculation for tidal delta habitat extent. Um, here's an area, this would be a polygon. Um, there'd be a polygon oh, of low of low tide terrace here, and that goes into the tidal delta extent metric, but not the primary area. There's a little bit of marsh and some blind channels, some of those blind channels um, where there's map blind channel that would go into the prime rearing habitat um, uh, calculation and so forth. So hopefully that clarifies what's measured and how metrics are calculated. So here's the slide of all the restoration projects um, in gray that have been built. Um, and then the ones in blue have not yet been built, but we think will be built. Um, and I think Richard might be talking a little bit about some of this um, later. But anyway, this is a table that got, was um, taken from the last IMW annual report. Um, so what I wanted to point out and what I will focus on will be the projects that are in this middle part that all contribute to the recovery plan because um, this is a, a talk about the status of estuary restoration for recovery. So um, fortunately, all these projects um, that all the projects that have been built have been monitored. I um, have some um, and, and that's these are just uh, years monitored in the type of design. I'm not going to focus on that. I have a replacement slide that hopefully clarifies some more things about these projects. And that's this slide. So we have, I'll just go through them line by line. Um, we have the project, the South Warnsme Smokehouse floodplain SRT project. It's in the um, Swinomish Channel Polygon. It was completed in 2005 and the first fish re response would be in 2006. So the habitat response to the as-built project is, um, 16.34 hectares, hectares, not acres, um, 
of the of the tidal extent um, metric and 14.8 hectares of prime rearing habitat. So we monitored that project a, a number of years. Um, the the results of that monitoring are reported in um, a, a project or a uh, a study that Corey Green was the lead author on in 2012. Um, and basically it found that the, the fish densities, the Chinook densities are much, much lower in the, in the restored area than the reference sites. And then that's, that's not probably news to anybody. Um, it's pretty well known now that projects behind or rearing area behind SRTs do not perform like reference sites. So, um, so that's the, that's the result for that particular project. And I would just say, fortunately, um, that area is going to be exposed to full tidal inundation sometime in the near future um, through dike um, removal and setback. So that's kind of how this table works. And I'll just go through a little bit and highlight some of them. But you can, the one reason to have this table incorporated in the record for the Science Summit series is that you can go back and see a synopsis of the project, its habitat metrics and what the fish results were, and then look up the reference if you want. So um, South Fork Dyke Setback, that was built in 2006, and it had um, a fair tidal footprint change or a habitat extent change um, of which about 0.26 hectares of tidal channel were formed. Again, monitoring showed that, Chinook densities were lower at that site um, than reference sites, and that was believed to be due to poor connectivity, um, some sediment sills at the mouth. And again, this is a site where um, there's active, um, if, well, there's a design, and I don't think it's been built yet, but um, phase two is going in and going to expand the site and hopefully correct that um, connectivity. So uh, one I want to point out is what might be a little bit of a conundrum to people is that there's a couple phases of restoration at Milltown and yet a future one, a larger one to be built. And there's no change in tidal extent the way we measure it. And that's because it's excavating channel, those earlier phases excavated channels at the expense of some other tidal habitat. So there's no change in um, tidal delta habitat extent, but there is an increase in prime rearing habitat. So Milltown um, phase 1A and phase, uh, where is it, 1B, it's the same thing. So there was channel, there were channels dug um, at the expense of other tidal habitats. So it's a benefit to Chinook salmon, but it's not a change in tidal delta habitat extent. Um, some of these other projects, uh, I guess I would want to highlight is that Wiley Slough, um, there's two separate parts. One part's in the Bayfront, Wiley Lobe. The other part's in the South Fork. It's across from the um, training levee um, that's in the, in the site. And so both of, those had, both of those project areas within the overall Wiley Slough had a huge tidal delta um, habitat extent lift and also a huge prime rearing area extent lift largely because of lots of impoundment um, area. And so that's something that you'll see later on and Greg did show in the presentation back in June that those impoundments are transitioning into a matrix of a mosaic of, of tidal wetlands, uh, vegetated wetlands and marshes and then and blind channels. So there's, there's changes, there's a huge lift and after initial build, but yet those habitats are changing somewhat. Um, I think for the sake of time, I think I'm going to move on. Horlein Farms is the most recent project built in 2016, and now we've got have that captured in our status and trends data because uh, we, we have now a complete layer for this area um, through 2019. Um, in general, most of all, all these projects, if there's good tidal connectivity, the densities of Schnick salmon are equal to reference sites. So that's, a, that's all really good news. Um, here's a map view of what I just went over. It, um, in the restoration projects, that would show up in yellow, but it also has the rest of the changes in tidal delta um, habitat extent. So we have, um, we have gains and losses and I've categorized them into natural, 
or anthropogenic or human caused. So um, a natural gain is this beige color and you can see a little bit of beige um, in this change period from 2004 to 2013 and a little bit more of it little, it shows up a little better in the 2013 to 2019 period, especially along the bay fronts of the North Fork. So, so that's that progradation that we talked about a bit um, at la the last time we met. Um, but what really shows up for gains is also the restoration and that's, that's by design. So we, we have some big yellow polygons um, showing up. And then, but, and then the other thing that I really want to point out is that, um, that it's a non-thing that you can't see. There's no big white polygons along here. And that's because there are no anthropogenic losses. There's actually only two polygons detected by our methodology um, where, where habitat was lost um, by filling or that sort of thing. And one was up, I think it's, uh doesn't even show up on this map, but there was some um, riprap to fix an area that needed um, fixing. So that chain that was detected in our methodology as a, as a fill. And then there was, as part of the Fisher Slough um, project, there was a reroute of the existing channel um, to get it more sinuous. So there was, it as in the gains of restoration, there was a small, tiny loss. Um, but so anyway, the big news is there's not these human caused losses direct human cause losses detected in the habitat status and trends um, monitoring. Um, but there are natural losses um, and, they're, and they coincide with erosion on the bayfront. And especially in this latter time period, 2013 to 2019, you have a big bayfront erosion um, area, but it's somewhat in the South Fork and a little bit in the North Fork. So this is for tidal delta habitat extent. So there's the total area on the in hectares on the x axis primary x axis and it looks like a fairly flat line you can see some bump ups when restoration occurred but there's so at plotted at this scale when you have nearly 3000 hectares of that kind of habitat um, you know it doesn't show like you're gaining a lot and that that's informative because this is what the fish are you know responding to uh, or, or one of them variables that you could measure that fish are responding to. And so um, the other way we can look at that and learn a little bit more about it is to do a net zero from the starting period. So you'd say there was before restoration in our, in our data set. So 2004, it starts at zero. How did it change? And you see what happens is there's a small amount of erosion. Then there's a, there's a gain. I think it's South Fork. Um, Dykesek back and smokehouse um, restoration, then some more erosion. Then the next big bump is Wiley Slough restoration. So it goes way up. Then there's some erosion. And then there's the next restoration project, which would be Fisher Slough. Then there's erosion. And then there's another bump up, which is uh, Fur Island Farm. So that's, how, so that's how it works. It gives you a picture of that map in sort of the, the um, annual trends. Um, but what is more interesting, or that's interesting of itself, and that's a good analytical tool to pair with our fish data. Um, and we have the same graphs for prime rearing area. In fact, they're much more encouraging because of, you know, uh, because of what's going on in the North Fork, and that goes down to this bottom graph. And so I've plotted the tidal delta habitat extent for each of those four main um, sub-delta areas. So the first one is Bayfront. And so you can look at that color and you see there's erosion and then you have the Wiley Slough restoration project go up, happen. And so Wiley, the Wiley lobe is part of the Bayfront. So you get a big bump and then there's some erosion and then you see a big drop and that's changing from these large impoundment areas morphing into tidal channel and, and marsh. So it is, um, it's, it's reducing overall the tidal footprint along with the erosion. And then we have a big bump with Fur Island Farms and more, and more of that um, changes. So, so that's a story with the Bayfront. And then I wanna contrast with the North Fork where no restoration has occurred. 
um, we saw progradation. And so starting about um, be, just after the 2000 photo, you can see the gains that you get um, from sediment changes with the new distributary. And it's even more pronounced um, when you look within the tidal footprint and count the habitat changes from distributary channel to marsh and blind channel, you get a huge bump in prime rearing habitat. So the kind of the nuggets are for each area is that bayfront, you have sort of this theme of chronic seaward erosion and transition of impoundments um, to some other habitat types. And the North Fork, while there's not been restoration, there's still habitat gains in response to the avulsion channel and sediment dynamics. So downstream of the avulsion, you get filling and um, senescing of the distributaries into blind channels, which is better for fish rearing than distributaries um, in, in, a, in a density standpoint. South Fork, it's been the focus of most of the restoration, but it has chronic um, seaward er um, erosion, not as bad as the bayfront. And then swim channel, um, majority of the tidal um, channels behind SRT, we talked about that, um, and that hopefully will soon be um, fully functioning tidal habitat. And the other thing that's really true in swim channel is there's just a huge lack of tidal marshes or the vegetated tidal wetlands. So that's hopefully a little better um, explanation of the habitat results in the context of the areas where restoration has been done or and in, including the North Fork. Um, and this is just a picture of the, the Wiley area, the Wiley Slough restoration area, um, 2013 on the top panel, 2019 on the bottom, and you can see the huge change in the light blue, the, the amount of area in the light blue um, from top to bottom. And that's, that's how we've ended up, you know, when you look at the aerial photos, that's how it maps out by these habitat types. So that's that transitioning from one um, habitat type to another. Um, so what's measured for Chinook salmon? Um, abundance or density, um, which we would calculate abundance from. We also measure the timing of the fish, their body size, sometimes a lot more, their age or diets. Um, lots of other things, but the currency, mostly what we've shown you is all abundance related um, information. And then um, it's measured across multiple life stages. We've been, we're talking about the estuary life stage, but we, we measure um, the big we, we measure across multiple life stages. Um, and, it, and the big we is a collaborative effort and it's been going um, where we have really good quality data since the um, 1990s. So we have, they're almost 30 years of data um, at this type, this really good quality data. Um, so here's just a life cycle model or a cartoon and I'll just click through who's doing what. So all the co-managers are doing spawner surveys where we get an abundance estimate for escapement. Um, the state under Joe Anderson's program measures juveniles leaving the lower river. So the small trap and small trap population estimates. We are measuring in the estuary um, using beach sands and bike traps where we collect a lot of density data and then we can make abundance estimates from that. Um, with NOAA, we're also measuring in the near shore where we do with, where we make abundance estimates. And then there's a large we um, across the North Pacific um, in Puget Sound where we're measuring, um, doing catch sampling with, from the Cote d'Ivoire tag set. Um, and sport fishery um, krill census, where you're taking that data and measuring and estimating abundance by different um, fisheries and locations. So that's the fish monitoring. And so what is it, what are the sort of the simple bullets about how fit Chinook salmon are responding to estuary restoration in this gadget? So there's two things and there, I would refer you to one report and um, it's a fairly substantial update of the IMW done in 2016. Again, it's on my last slide, a hot link to it. But basically, um, if you build the build or if you restore a site in the estuary, the fish will come. They're using juvenile Chinook are using these sites um, immediately following restoration. So the next year. Um, and then the other theme is some designs work better than others. And again, we've talked about this a bunch of times that basically if you restore 
the full tidal process, you'll get fish. You'll get fish densities similar to, and even in some cases better than reference sites. So those tend to be the dike setback types of designs, dike breaches if the breaches are big enough, um, and fill removal. SRTs is not a good, doesn't get you the fish response. So does it? So that's pretty overwhelmingly obvious um, when you do the effectiveness monitoring in this gadget. And it's not necessarily the case in other um, estuaries where you have so overwhelming success with a lot of fish in the restored areas. Um, then the population response. So we're seeing in the IMW, we have it sort of in three categories and we're still working on getting the data and analyzing the data. But from the 2016 report, the themes have remained somewhat the same, and but we're but we're learning a little bit more about the size of fish and the um, small to adult recruits, um, which we'll get that out soon. But basically, when you do when you add on more habitat, you have less crowding, you increase the residence time of the fish, and they can get bigger and then more fit to survive. And we're seeing that there's a reduced number of those fry migrants that Mike talked about in the near shore, and that's coinciding with improved small to adult rates. Um, so that's how the story works for the population. And we wish it wasn't so complicated and we wish it would be way more obvious, but if you go back and to the status and trends of habitat um, slide, that one I showed you where the total tidal delta habitat extent, there's, there's not a huge net change um, so that's what the fish are exposed to. Um, that's what the that's what's happening to the fish. So you wouldn't really expect a huge signal yet. We have not increased the amount of estuary um, anywhere close to what the uh, recovery plan um, goals are. But we are making progress, and so that's I think that's my last slide. So here's the references again. This stuff will be posted, so you'll be able to go find it um, if you need to. Just see if there's any clarifying questions. A couple of things. I have a, I suppose my question starts with, we're still looking at the 2,700 acre metric, uh, which equates to 1.35 million smolt. Is that correct? Yeah. So that the, the 2,700 as long as it's, it, it's, it's really the, the goal is the smolt, the, the change in carrying capacity, um, which is an increase of 1.35 million smolts for the estuary from from the 2005 capacity and so the 2700 acres is sort of a generalized um, acreage that came out of the um, plan the suite of actions sh shown in the plan but the reality is like it depends on where those acres are because connect you know their location matters so some places are more strategic than others but, so what's been the smolt response then? I didn't see any numbers of smolt. I saw a lot of acreages and hectares, but I didn't see the smolt. And the second part to that is it seems as though it's a fluid number where if you have a hundred acre restoration site, it looks like now that's translating to, well, it's not actually a hundred acres restoration, but something much less. So how are we actually measuring a successful restoration project that's taking, uh, admittedly from my perspective, agricultural land out of production? or wood? So, so I can answer part of that. I can't answer all of that. I think that, um, so again, I'm, I'm a scientist charged with monitoring stuff. I don't make the decisions on how, how things get credited or not. That would be others that, that decide that. So well, it has nothing to do with crediting. It has to do with just understand where we're at with yeah. the progress or not. So I can give you I can't tell you off the top of the head the smolt numbers, but I can tell you you can go look in those references and where we where we did the monitoring and and looked at the monitoring built compared to the as built the fish monitoring results compared to the as built uh, restoration. We made calculations on what the carrying capacity was at the time of as built, and so a number of those projects had that and. Um, and so that's all transparent. What people are doing with that, I'm not part of. So well, that that's hard for me because I'm hearing new terms like tidal delta habitat extent that I've never heard before. But I know questions that I have heard before and have been raised is where are we at with smolt? 
And so if we have to keep going and looking in reports and buried information or quite frankly, unclear information as to what the projects are actually producing in smolts, why can't that be produced in, in a forum like, like this along with the title Delta Habitat Extent? I, I'm just, I'm confused there. So I, I, you need to bring that up with those that make the decisions. So, so that would be an important improvement. Well, isn't that a research decision, Eric? No, it's not. I mean, I can make those calculations and I have done them, but I'm not, it's not, I don't have a place to provide those numbers to that's not part of the monitoring adaptive management framework that we've been asked to deal with. Uh, Brandon, I'll, I'll take that as, as well noted. And um, I think something we, we absolutely need to get um, you know, transparent because there is information out there and it's not, I'd say, well summarized because it is complicated. But um, I think the, we can tackle that as a group discussion at the board of directors. And Mike, you have something to say? Yeah, uh, Brandon, um, I didn't see you. Uh, you might have been at the other meetings. I didn't see you there. Yeah, I sure uh, was. I've been at every one of them. You bet. You've been. Okay, cool. Um, so one of the things is as scientists, we're asked to bring information. And so this is what we brought, these we were asked to. Um, but your what you raise is legitimate. And yes, we could we could start talking about that as well. This is just what we were asked to present this time. So um, thank you, gentlemen. It's just a very difficult thing to continue to see acreages. But um, when you're in a system where we're talking about functional uh, improvement and we're talking about populations, it's hard for me to then translate back and forth from habitat to populations without having any clarity of what where what we're measuring and where we're actually trying to achieve. Um, and then I just want to make sure we're we're still looking at 2,700 acres, correct? The plan, the plan hasn't changed, so that's that's okay. okay. Great, thank you. Thanks, guys. I I hey, want to just yeah. Well, I'm getting there. So <laughs> you're next. Go ahead. Uh, I wanted to test the hypothesis with Eric uh, that seems to apply in both the North and South Fork. You were describing how there were these uh, habitat losses on the bayfront, particularly toward the South Fork. Doesn't that correspond exactly to the sedimentation that's occurred in the freshwater slough project, the Wiley Slough project? You, you just showed where the sediment went that would have been filling in those places, it seems to me. And maybe there's another explanation, but that was my reaction. What do you think about that? I think Greg might touch a little bit on that, but I think that what, what um... What we showed and reported in the Wiley Slough monitoring report is that the amount of wet area that fish were living in is outside the norm of what you see in reference marshes. So it, it, it fundamentally had all these ponds, impoundments, and that um, because you don't see those in reference areas, we wouldn't expect those ponds to be sustainable. So where the sediment comes to, to fill those ponds and how they, how they morph from all those large impoundments to something else, we didn't, we didn't provide a mechanism on that. We didn't speculate, but we said it should be, it's, it's probably not sustainable because that's not what we see as a norm in nature. And then subsequent to that, we're learning about how that, how that changes. And Greg, Greg is the one that um, explain some of that and how sediment accretion is working. As far as where the sediment is coming from, there's, there's sediment from the river. I don't think, I think it's a separate thing personally, the bayfront erosion from, from filling of Wiley. Um, I think they're sort of separate things. I, I can try to, this is Greg, I'll try to give a quick um, summary answer to, to Gary's question, if I, if I understand it correctly. I think Gary's suggesting that there's kind of a zero sum of sediment between different parts of the South Fork, for example, that any, any sediment that goes into Wiley Slough must come at the expense of sediment somewhere else, if I understand the, the question correctly. And, and that's not really true. Um, the South, the, I mean, the South Fork is a really complicated, as you know, um, set of distributary channels. <clears throat> And, and some of the major losses in the South Fork 
are due in part because one of the big distributaries coming off of Tom Moore Slough is meandering and it's eroding away marsh in the course of its meandering. And that's not being replaced by sediment being deposited somewhere else in that area. Um, so that's, and then, and then there's other, other erosion that's occurring, I think because of wave attack is my, would be my guess. Um, that's a little further north of, of, that, of, that, of the first site that I mentioned. And, and then the sediment is, you know, it's being, I mean, another place for sediment to go is simply just to be bypassing everything and going out into the bay. So it's really complicated as where sediment is going and where it's being deposited and, you know, and how it's flowing throughout the whole network. Um, it's super complicated. So it's not, it's not really as simple to say that if it goes to X then it can't go to Y. And if it goes to Y, then it can't go to X. It, you know, it's, it's way more complicated than that. Um, so it would be nice if it were simple, but it's not. So I, ho I hope that answers your question. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think though that the other side of it on the North Fork, you're showing an increase in habitat there and clearly it's there's sediment accumulating that's that's producing more habitat. Is, yeah, maybe I should go I ahead and, and yeah. maybe I should go ahead and start my presentation because that'll that will address that question, Gary. So, so I was given a list of questions that had been raised, and so, and some of them include, one of them includes the one that Gary just raised. That's why I'm kind of, I just like to go through this just for the sake of being organized, in order. So, so the first question that I that I was encountered with was was do virtually all rivers make natural banks which confine their ordinary flow, except at points of confluence with tributaries, and the simple and straightforward answer is yes, and I could leave it at that, and it's very tempting to just leave it at that, but um, I thought probably more is expected of me. So, um, so I wanna focus on, the, on this phrase, make natural banks, because, um, you know, a, I mean, all channels have banks. And so what I think was meant by making natural banks was the process of, of rivers forming natural levees. So rivers making a natural levee. And so that's what you see in this cartoon to the right here is you have this idealized channel um, starting from zero where of course it has banks, but then during repeated floods, um, you know, as the floodwaters go down the channel and they overtop the bank, um, the velocity of the water drops as soon as it overtops the bank. And so it drops out sediment that's being that's suspended because the velocity is lower. And so you get these, what are called natural levees along the banks. I think that's what, what the question meant when it was talking about making a natural bank. It's you're, you're making these natural levees that increase the height of the bank relative to the floodplain behind it. And this happens even with small tidal channels in the, in, and where you just have tidal flows that overtop a tidal channel and the tidal flows are carrying suspended sediment and they drop sediment too when they overtop the bank. And so you have these natural levees that are in, in, the, in a tidal channel, they're so subtle that you might only see them, you know, as the tide's rising and flooding and you're standing on the last dry spot of, of ground that's right next to a channel. So, you know, these natural levees get built up over time and with the bigger the river and the river that's carrying more, more sediment, the, the bigger the, the levees in general. Now there are also man-made levees um, and, and, and those are different. They're not made by floods, obviously, they're made by human beings and they're made to prevent floods. And because of that, they're much, much higher than natural levees. You know, a natural levee, like on a tidal channel, might be a few inches to maybe a foot high. And on a big distributary, they might be a couple of feet high. Um, and, and that the natural levees provide some habitat diversity. You know, shrubs and trees can grow on them, depending on where you are in the estuary and, and, and how high, high the levee is. Um, and, and just to, to show the contrast a little more, here's an, a, what I'd like as an example. This is a map of New Orleans and the French Quarter is right here where my cursor is, is moving around. That's the original location of the city of New Orleans back in the 1718s or whatever. And that was built on a natural levee. It was high ground. And all these green areas in this map are areas that are above sea level. And you can see that, you know, a lot of New Orleans is, is on this high ground, it's the older parts of the city. And then as it expanded, it expanded to less ideal areas. The, the yellow areas are um, equal to sea level, more or less. And then the orange areas are below sea level. 
Um, and to protect the city, even the city that's on the natural levees, they have a 20 foot high man-made levee that's built obviously much, much taller than, than the natural levee. So the city you know, was built on a natural levee to protect itself kind of naturally early on. And then it was a, a, extra uh, defense was added to it by, by adding the 20 foot high levee. So that's, that's kind of the, you know, both levees at once are, are present in, this, in the case of the city of New Orleans. So I hope that answers that question. Uh, question number two, do distributary channels ordinarily occur as a result of a combination of high volume and high velocity flows sufficient to overtop and then breach the natural bank? So this is a, a no and yes answer. And to explain what I mean by that is that there are, there are two processes that form distributaries. The more common one is channel splitting around river mouth bars. And that's what you see in this, in the, in this these figures to the right, which comes out of the figure by, I mean, out of a paper by Edmonds and Slingland. It's a really nice paper. And they're describing, they're, they observed, you know, in a series of historical area photographs, um, basically progradation of this delta. This is actually a, a, a river delta that empties into a lake. So this is a non-tidal delta. You don't see many papers about those. Um, and basically what happens here is that the river is carrying sediment. And when that river water hits this larger body of water, a lake or a bay or the ocean, the, you know, the momentum of that river water de decreases really quickly. And so it drops a lot of sediment at its mouth and that becomes a mouth bar and the river splits around it. it initially the mouth bar is, is uh, you know, unvegetated, it's low elevation, but as it gains, sediment over time, it becomes vegetated and becomes a marsh in the case of the tidal marshes. I guess there's freshwater marshes too in, the, in a lake. Uh, and that, that process happens repeatedly with every distributary branch. Every distributary branch drops a little more sediment at its mouth and you get another uh, mouth bar and you get another bifurcation, another split around that mouth bar. And you can see that happens over time here in this figure. Um, you get to some point where, um, the energy for a particular distributary channel is so small that it can't split around anymore and it just stays a single channel. And so there's a limit to how much splitting you get, which also shows that there's a relationship between delta size and the number of distributaries um, that it can have. Oh yeah, so this is, this is probably the more common process, but you also have avulsion. This is less common. And, and in fact, in this, in this image that you see here, there's only one occurrence of an avulsion here at B. And the rest of the time, it's it's uh, it's you know repeated um, mouth bars. And the same is true if you look at the North Fork. You know we have um, aerial photographs of the North Fork from 1937 to the present, and you see a bunch of essentially mouth bars and and distributaries forming, and some of them senescing and becoming blind tidal channels. And there's only been one observed uh, avulsion. And that's the the recent one that we have. And that avulsion, just like most avulsions, reoccupied an old channel. It, it occupied a blind tidal channel that was there previously, and it made that channel much larger. And that's typical of avulsions. Um, they actually, you know, in all kinds of, of um, described systems, avulsions typically reoccupy and occur in uh, pre existing, previously abandoned uh, distributaries or side channels of some kind. So that's kind of a long-winded answer to a simple question, but but that's uh, uh, you know that's as complete as I can be there. Now the question: If distributary channels are good for salmon habitat, why not restore the channel connecting the main stem of the Skagit River to Padilla Bay and achieve substantial flood damage reduction benefits in addition to increasing juvenile salmon access? So that's been contemplated, uh, and and you can get this report from Skagit County's webpage, uh, the Skagit River Flood Risk Management General Investigation. And they've got, they go into a fair amount of detail about a couple of a couple of proposals for that. And I'm just showing one of them, what they call the Swimish Bypass, and and the design was was it was 2,000 feet wide along its length. I think it's six miles long. It was a th over a thousand acres. It had intake and outlet structures, so they had man-made structures to control when the river would go into it, and it would only go in for 25-year and greater floods. And there was no channel excavation proposed for this. So it was just basically a flood, you know, literally a flood bypass thing. So in other, in other words, there was no, when well, they were considering fish screens at both ends of the structures, but 
they were deemed impractical because they would get clogged up by debris and they would have to be three miles long. Some, I don't really, I don't understand that part. I don't know how you make a three mile long fish screen, but in order to keep the fish, I guess, from being smushed right through the screens because of the high flood flows. So they basically wanted to keep fish out of that. So it wasn't a fish habitat thing. So, you, you know, they weren't, they were proposing um, an artificial flood control structure that was not at all fish habitat. So you wouldn't get two benefits there. You have some flood benefits, but you wouldn't get fish habitat benefits. I guess I don't think I have anything else to add to that unless someone's to, you know, you can certainly have, like for all these, I'd be willing to follow up if you have follow-up questions. Um, if a cross island connector were created as a restoration project, what would happen to salmon habitat if half the river volume flowed to the new channel and dewatered the north and south forks proportionally for the next 30 years? So I guess the first thing I would say is that um, if a cross island connector were created, we wouldn't be making it that large, right? You wouldn't make it bigger than the north or south forks. You wouldn't make it so that half the flow is going through it. You, you know, I would imagine you'd do something like restoring maybe dry slough or restoring Brown's Hall slough or something similar. And so it'd be a much smaller distributary and, and flow in distributaries is generally proportional to the width of the distributary. There was a nice paper about that recently um, showing how, you know, how good at, at, at estimation that, that little rule of thumb is. So the cross island connector across Fair Island would be a lot smaller and carry much less flow than the North or South Forks, so much less than half. So, but if you did that, flow would be diminished in both the North and South Forks because you'd be redirect, redirecting some portion of that flow to the new cross island connector, obviously. And, and as a result, because of diminished flow in the North and South Forks, some sediment would be deposited as bars in the North and South Fork distributaries, either mid-channel bars, kind of islands, or, or point bars where there's meanders or, or um, just general sidebars. Uh, so that would cause distributary narrowing. It would increase the marsh area by creating new marsh on the bars. And it would also increase blind tidal channel length. And we, we've, you know, we've, I actually wrote a paper about this process because we can look at the historical photos and we can see this happening. And Tom Moore is a really you know, dramatic example because it's been filling in quite a lot, Tom Moore Slough. And you see um, a lot of uh, bars that kind of start out as, as channel bars, like kind of in the, off to the side of the, of the, of the center line. And eventually those, those bars merge with, with the, the mainland and they basically form an extension of existing blind tidal channels. So the blind tidal channels lengthen. Um, I've got a paper on that, which, which I actually, I, I, you can see it down below at the bottom here. So that's what you'd expect in the North and South Forks. And then where you have the new distributary, you would have flow and sediment delivering to the Bay Fringe marshes at the mouth of the Cross Island Connector. And that would, at the very least locally, if not a little more larger and larger scale, um, it would stabilize and eventually reinvigorate the marshes and the associated blind tidal channels near the mouth of the distributary. So, and also, you know, in addition to that, actually, I won't mention it here, but it would deliver more fish to the, to the Bay Fringe area so they could take better advantage of those Bay Fringe marshes. Uh, right now, their densities are a lot lower than they are like in the North or South Forks.